Right. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna start recording. Sure. Hey, hey, so 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 this is Sheets. I'm, I'm here with Rick, and this is a perfect time to do this because we, it's it's not it's it's post content, right? It's like the, the, the tournament has started. And nobody wants to hear who we like anymore. You know, you're not going through the same stuff about how many different ways do you want to play Joel Damon, praying he's only 11 percent owned when you knew he's going to be 19, and 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 all this stuff. And 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 so one of the things I wanted to, to catch up with with Rick about is just basically kind of like the state of, of of golf gambling and DFS and and all things Rick Run Good kind of in general. You know, um, because you know what's First of all, just I hate to keep pumping you up, right? But but one thing I always respected about you is like, listen, when it comes to content, there's so many ways to do it. And, and Rick has always been just kind of like the pillar of honesty out there. You know, like he comes in, he does his thing, he says what he likes, says his feelings. And when something happens, he doesn't doesn't brag throughout the entire universe. Like he doesn't give out 30 picks. And then when one of them comes in say, like, Ooh, look what I did. Look how smart I am, whatever. He's very humble. He, he has a, he, and what's also really cool about Rick is that I guess still, I still don't literally don't believe it, but he, he runs kind of this whole site himself, which is kind of bizarre in a way. I can't, I can't even imagine that. And it's all, it's always really good content. It's always very dedicated to golf. It respects the game. It respects gambling and hit and your em, not to say empire, but your your reach is kind of growing a little bit. I know that you've gotten involved in the in the jock market stuff. Yeah. Um, and I, I want to hear a little bit how that's going because since we've last spoke, which is I guess over, over a year ago, you know, sports betting became legal in like so many places since then, and and, and specifically New York, right? Uh, among other places. And there's just so many opportunities to to leverage your your knowledge of a sport. Um, in the gambling world. And, and I was, listen, I was having this discussion with someone. Um, I was talking with an MMA expert last week. I had him on here. And one of the things that um, has not been done yet, okay, is, is for people to combine the disciplines in like a very, in, a, in an analytical way. Like this, this is what I mean. Let, let's say that you like a golfer. Let's say you like Joel Damon. Okay. You think that whatever his price is, 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 is a good deal. Well, should you bet that guy in the in the in the in the betting market or should you play a lot of him in dfs or should you play him in jock market where is the best way to do that and then what's kind of cool is that let's say that you like a certain prop you know like if you like a prop is it better just to play the prop straight or to play it in dfs knowing that maybe it's been underappreciated and then even more so let's say that you have and i'm, I'm talking through talking a zillion thoughts and this is what I thought about when I first started doing DFS. Let's say that you run like 150 DFS lineups and through day two, you know, you have X, Y, Z kind of at the top projecting to score really well. How, if at all, should you maybe hedge that? You know, you have, you have incredible access to all these ways to bet on stuff and no one has really been able to put all of that together in like, okay, so here's my lineups. They're ready to do well, to do this. And I have these other options to to leverage off of that. What's the best way to do that? So I, I, again, that's that's kind of interesting that that very few people have done that. So I want to go back. So so let talk about how you allocate your time between say DFS, gambling, and jock market, and I guess media. Yeah. So first off, uh, always appreciate the kind words. It, it's always fun to get on here. I'm, I'm glad we, I'm glad the tournament has started. We can just sit here and talk about right. like the state of the industry and everything yeah. else. It's, it's uh much more, much more exciting stuff. So, yeah. so yeah, I kind of, um I kind of think I've got like multiple full-time jobs, right? Like my, like rickrungood.com, the website creating a giant golf database and creating tools that I think are valuable for myself and for others. That's like, one of my full-time jobs that, that, that takes up a, a lot of my time and energy. Then there's, then there's content creation, whether that is via uh, YouTube videos or podcasts or my relationship with CBS sports, that is another huge chunk. And then really um, tertiary is actually getting to make wagers on this stuff. Right. right. And I've, and I've told people and people are very aware of this, like that, that's not my living, right? Like I'm not doing this for a living. I, I love the, <clears throat> the process and the strategy and it's a nice little side income, but uh, there are a lot of times where I'm late to markets because I'm 
updating the website or I'm doing content for CBS sports. And I know I might not be getting the best of it. Um, So I'm constantly balancing that side of things because really getting into getting into the markets late in general um, has, has been tough for me. And then as far as once I'm in those markets um, so, so it's, it's, it's a lot of outrights. It's a lot of head to head matchups. And then um, I do like the jock market side of things. That's stock market DFS for those that, that are not uh, familiar because it, you know, it's funny. I'm, I'm always trying to diversify my portfolio in general, and that is like literally stock market DFS, right? So there's a lot of different ways um, that I think you can attack that. And that's been getting a lot more of my attention lately. Well, tell, well, why don't you tell me about that then? So tell me about the growth. Let's go back to that. Tell me about the growth of that business in general, like the, like the, like the jock, the jock market, because to be quite, to be quite honest, like, listen, those of you who don't know by now, I mean, like this, this that's my, my world, right? I've run a hedge fund for 20 years, right? So, so, so that's always been very interesting to me. And and since you know you started to really promote the jock market, there have been no fewer than two or three kind of competing type companies that have that have that have you know, come to me and to discuss this. I, I gave one of them some money because they were like old poker X Factor subs, you know that that these whatever. <laughs> and then there there was a guy I know who um, who actually owns and runs a secondary trading market for for NFTs that was you know was wondering you know how you could trade interests in players and things like that and how do you get around the fact that if it's is it gambling versus security because if it's considered for security then you're liable for certain types of, of regulations and things like that so 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 tell me about that business tell me how active it is tell me people are interested in it because there's so many ways to freaking bet that i just can't get to everything you know it's like they're, so they're like in nfl so many people do best ball i don't even know the rules you know there's so many things that people do you know some like even you put out this like one and done pool whatever it is i i went into it i didn't even know the rule i thought it was a survivor type pool where you had to pick guys to make the cut like one after the that, other that's that's similar but that's different there right. are so those, different. Do, so, those do exist so i stopped putting my entries in two weeks i totally forgot i donated so, so so when it came to the jock market and then there's prize picks and all yeah. this other stuff, you know, tell me about specifically about the jock market stuff. I guess let's yeah. start with that. Yeah, let's let's start there. So so the the, uh, the concept around athletes being stocks, it, that's not new. I remember being in high school, like during study hall, and there were websites that let you build portfolios of athletes and depending on what their you know game results were, their stock price would go up or it would go down and be a fun little game to play. <clears throat> So this concept is not new. There, there, there have been others that have failed to pull this off. Jock Market launched, God, I want to say they launched summer of 2022. It was like the worst, or excuse me, 2020, like during the pandemic, you probably could not have launched this at a worse time. Golf was like the only sport that was that was going on. And uh, they have an IPO phase that allows you to, to bid on shares of all athletes across all sports. And then you're, you can trade uh, live. So for golf, it's really handy because you get four days and you get natural stopping points after each round where you can trade, you can buy more shares, you can sell your shares, you can now short your shares. But what, what I like about jock market is um, they were like, like they, they, they've done it the best, right? Others have failed at this. They make it very easy. It's, it's almost, um, you know, Robin hood esque in the way of how easy it is to kind of make these, these transactions. And now you're seeing, you know, a rod has um, I think it's called Mojo that that's, that just popped up a couple of months ago a rod backs this this app which is a similar concept i think it's only available in new jersey at the moment but like it the the idea of using this as a way to differentiate uh your your fantasy or your or your betting portfolio is exciting because because like the out i'm gonna give you examples for golf because that's that's my world um you know only one guy is going to win the golf tournament each week sheets right like only one guy wins but in the jock market all your guy has to do is outperform his expectation. So a guy can finish right. 42nd and make you a ton of money or enough money or make you a profit. So the only issue that I that I think this this industry is running into with stock market DFS is, and I'm sure you're aware of this, like there's a there's an education barrier 
right? Like they're right. like people who aren't day trading or aren't very familiar with how the stock market works, trying to then take those concepts and put them into, into athletes. It, like their jock market and all these, like they've invested a lot of money in education because that's really the biggest barrier at the moment. Well, yeah, you know, it's a, from the because the, the company that I was kind of dealing with. I mean, part of their their onboarding was just explaining to people even how short some how to short sell in general works, you know, and because it's not it's not exactly the easiest thing to easiest thing to do. Let me ask you, do, do, it's like let's use Jock Mark as an example. I mean, today, uh, how do I put it? Do they get volume? Are, are people playing there? I mean, like, is yeah, it a big deal? So, I mean, so they've, um, I mean, they they've j they just closed another round of funding. I mean, they they are uh, they're I don't know their exact numbers, but the the markets are getting much 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 more liquid. And you mentioned they just added um, shorting. So now these IPOs that were previously only 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 bids, only buys, you can now short during IPO, which is making these markets uh, a lot more liquid, a lot more accurate. It, it's, it's, I think it's only going to get, uh, it's only going to get better, right? It's, it's a situation where you need people playing, you need people in the markets, mixing it up and, and, and making this as efficient as possible. And they haven't had, they've had no viral moments. They've had nothing like that. It's just been like steady growth for two and a half years. So I, so I wonder again, if we, you know, we should have prepared this in advance. So if you had, if you had a golfer that you like, like some, I, I call it seven K cause I speak in terms of yep. DFS, right? Yeah. If you had like a $7,500 golfer that you liked, yep. if you're going to play him in DFS. You're playing him because you're hoping that I guess he makes top 20, top 10, maybe. Right. So if you like the $7,500 guy, what, what does that look like? In, in, in a jock market play. In other words, like what do those guys usually go off in, yeah. in um, uh, you know, what's their IPO price? What do they need to make X amount of money? You know, like what, like, if, like what, how, how do you get paid on your opinion? Like if you think that, 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 well, use Joel Damon as another example. Like if you think, if you like Joel Damon, you know, what's, what's the best way to play him? Like if you were going to play him at jock market, like what does that look like? Like what's he, like what was Joel Damon's IPO price, for example, going into yeah. this week? Yeah, so I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you a real example here. So so what was Joel Damon's price on DraftKings this week? I can I think pull it 70, 73, maybe. Okay, so so seventy three hundred dollars on DraftKings. So his IPO price this week was um five dollars and fifty nine cents per share. So the way that that ends up looking, uh give me one second here. I'm gonna pull this Hang up. On. Let me let me let me let me get these numbers actually correct so that we can compare apples to apples here okay um yeah he was actually 7200 he was 7200 okay so he, and he ipo'd at 559 so the way that jock market works is every finishing position has a guaranteed payout okay that's kind of the key here right so if right. you win the golf tournament that's worth $25 a share. If you finish second, that's worth 20 a share. Oh, okay. Yes. So 559, Joel Damon would essentially need to finish 31st or better. 31st would be $5.50 a share. To make anything, to be make zero, right? Correct. To to break even. So the 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 better he finishes compared to 31st, the more you make per share. And the worse he finishes to 31st, the 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 amount you'll lose per share will increase. And there's like a predetermined scale, right? It's not, it's not, there's no secondary market, it's not like buy and sell, right? So so it's it's a sec, it's it's a so it's sort of like stock market. So so but they tell you in advance what you need correct to 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 make X amount of money. Correct. Hmm. Yep. It's a all the all the pay scales are are set before they are disclosed. And what they they again, this is the education process sheets, right? So, right. so they have their own terminology. Um, they call it a fair value position, a break even position, essentially. So Joel Damon's fair value position would have been 31st place. That's what breaks him even. That breaks him now. Now, if you and this is like like dumb questions, right? So if you miss the cut. Yeah. Is there any difference between missing the cut at 69th or, or, or 130th? No. So the way that they have it set up for golf, a missed cut drops your share price to $1. To so one. You, yes. So for, jo for Joel Damon, you would lose $4.59 for every share of him that you had if he goes on and misses the cut. And what do you get if he finishes uh, like, t like T66 at the end? Uh, he just makes would, the cut and, does, and, and then finishes last of the remaining 65. 
you would get uh, like two bucks. So you would lose 40, uh, I guess, 60%, right? Yes. Yeah. So again, you know, it's, it's interesting. So if you are going to play a guy to make the cut at X amount, at X odds on the DraftKings Sportsbook. Right. I, I just I just had this weird feeling that using that somehow using all that your all your tools and all of your all of your your stuff that you can figure this out. Yeah. You know so, what what, like, so what you'll find a lot of is um, and you kind of got to be you don't even have to be. So so what ends up happening is the, the IPO that closes at at, you know, nine o'clock Eastern on Wednesday nights for golf. But you can put your bids in whenever. Right. Like you you can bid on to, you know, Tuesday morning or Wednesday morning, the max that you're willing to put in so that you're not getting involved in a bidding war at night and then you know it, it, you know jock market will increase your bid as necessary up to your maximum the same way that eBay does their their proxy bids so what you'll end up finding is when this IPO price you know when it settles you'll see guys you know where their um their IPO breaks them even at 20th but they might be minus 1 20 to finish inside the top 10 or something like that, right? When you start comparing it to the outright market. So you kind of immediately can see what the value on these guys is on Wednesday night compared to some of their, um, some of their finishing position numbers. Like there's, there's definitely just a, a, a calculation that you can run and find the value on these. And guys. so they, and they, um, and do you have the, do you have a calculator like that on your side? Uh, not specifically for that, but, uh, I, I have one that you I will, been, you should, yeah, I have one that I've been like just ironing out all of the, the details with the, the sports book APIs are always a little bit wonky. Okay. Um, so it's not something that I've been like comfortable enough pushing live because it honestly, it breaks, but yeah, I'll, I'll have something up. Um, and, and, was, and so the liquidity of it, so they tell you in advance what you're going to get paid. So they're essentially booking the bet right uh, uh so they have the liquidity to they're basically they're bookmaking the bet right because it's not coming from necessarily the people that are shorting it right so if right. you if you do ipo of, of, of joel damon and he wins the money comes from somewhere right so what right. do you think they're doing like, you think they're laying that off in like the wind market or are they just booking the bets or how does jack market even work yeah, so they're pretty so the there there's um they're pretty transparent about kind of the way that they start doing this. And I I don't like yeah. the terminology that they use, yeah. but they have uh they have jock bots in the market. Okay. And these jock bots will basically bid up each golfer to within 20% of their fair value. Uh, and then they stop bidding like eight hours before the IPO closes. So basically they run the, in theory, they could be running at a 20% loss right now. That's, that's the way they have this cooked in. Uh, but then they take a percentage of the transactions as well. So like 1% of your transaction they're making on that. But, on my, that. but my, but my point is if you, if you, if you take Joel Damon at five, yeah. and you put a hundred dollars on it, whatever, and he wins the tournament. And now you're entitled, I guess, to twenty five hundred, right? Is that the right twenty five bucks a share, yep. Right. So, so that money comes from yeah. the coffers of Jock Market. Correct. Right? They, okay. they, yeah, they they have to have this market as efficient as possible to 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 make money. Yeah, they're 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 covering it. But efficiency comes from oh, just from bets on the other golfers, I guess. Okay, I guess I guess that makes sense. Right. And and, and what are, what are what are what are the limits? Like, what, how much do people usually play? I know people are different, but are there are there big players in this? I mean, there are, are yeah, on? there are there are guys. Um, we had a guy uh, who crossed. Uh, we I, I brought him on my podcast. He crossed a million dollars in trades like right. eighteen months ago. Right. I mean, right. They, like it. it, it the, yes, there are some significant high volume people who are buying. Um, you know, for a golf market, thousands of shares that might be across. Um, it might be across 40 golfers or 50 golfers or something like that, but there are definitely guys who are in these markets for f at least five figures each week. So again, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, end game, perfect world, right? There are these, there are these sites like odds jam and these like sports betting sites that what they do is they is for sports betting. They, they scan all different ways to bet on, on something and right. they tell you what the most efficient way to do it is right. Or whatever it is. Right. So I, I, I'm telling you, in, in my in my dream world on RickRunGood.com, right? <laughs> right, right, no, seriously, you'll have like uh, a Joel Damon, and then based on your models and whatever it is, you know, you'll figure out what's the best value 
to on Joel Damon, whether that is in the jock market market, whether that is in the sports betting market, whether that is in the DFS market, whether that is in the prize picks market, whether it is some blend of, 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 of all of those. And just remember, DFS is there. DFS presumes that pretty much all the other markets are efficient, right? Because DFS says, okay, like based on the win odds, this is what its price should be. And then you do ownership or whatever. But I, I, I just feel as though that with all these different ways to do it, if you can have an opinion on a guy, there's got to be a efficient, more efficient way to, to not more efficient. There has to be the most efficient way to, to bet on a guy, given all the different ways you can do it. So I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm so curious to, to, to know where that goes. The, the other thing that I'd be interested to, and, and I completely agree with you. The other thing I, I would like to work into something like that. And I've, and I've thought about this for like my custom model or something like that is, yeah. is, is to almost ask like, Hey, like what's your risk tolerance? Yeah. Right. Like yeah. what are you, you know, you have an opinion on Joel Damon. What's your risk tolerance? Like here's like the optimized way, but like, if you're not comfortable, you know, betting somebody at 80 to one or, you know, whatever right. it ends up being kind of take it down different paths there. So interesting. Yeah. Tell, tell me about the, 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 see the golf betting market. Cause like when, yeah. before I, before I got into the, I didn't even, I, I didn't even know there was, there was betting on golf. If you want to know the truth. Um, uh, tell me about the golf betting market, how, how it's, how it explodes if it's if it has what like from your viewpoint like how much interest in is it in in the betting market has it accelerated a lot what types of things that people like to bet on how how efficient that's, that's another question like how efficient do you think that market is like is it is there is there edge to be found or is it or just are the odds just so brutal that that is really tough to find yeah. So, um, we're, we're seeing a lot more competition. We're seeing a lot more options. Um, if you, if you talk to, you know, the reps at some of these sports books, uh, golf is probably fifth or sixth in terms of popularity of, of sports out there, uh, and, and probably getting more popular. And then of course, when you have the four majors and the bigger events, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be huge. Um, the, the vast majority of what they're taking is, is outrights, uh, just because there is not there is not another market that I can think of off the top of my head that can reward a 100 to one bet in four days. Right. I mean, True. you look, you look at other sports, Except horse racing, horse racing. Right. Yeah. yeah. But you look at other sports. That's like, I got to have a futures ticket on somebody to win the world series for right. months. You know what True. I mean? Like it, it, it's just, it's a rare bird to be able to pull off something like that over four days. So that that's very enticing for the, the vast majority of the casual fans that are, that are putting it out there. We, um, the, you know, the, it depends on where you're at. I mean, Circa here in Vegas, they do a great job on their, on their outrights. It's probably the longest odds you can get, but the, the, the edges, the edges are in, are in the matchups. Um, the, the, mm. Some of these books are just no clue, awful setting lines at matchups. Um that that's where the edge is at. There's for, for, for most people who are getting access now across the States to these sports books, you're probably getting some pretty crappy outright lines. Right. Now, I would imagine. Yeah. Matchups is probably where they should be looking. Yeah. So how much do you think that is? In other words, like if you have, I mean, I presume that they have this all worked out, but if they have like a whole you know, set of 120 golfers with lines and stuff like that, um, you know, I presume that every line's bad, but, but how bad are they? You know what I mean? Like if you have, if you have, and we think about this because of DFS, right? So, and, and this is a mistake people make. Like if Scotty Scheffler is 10 to one to win the tournament, like on draft teams, people say, oh, that means he's 10% winning chances. No, yeah. it, it's not what it means. It means right. they're willing to give you 10 to one. That does not mean he has 10% winning chances. He has less, you know? Um, question is how much less? You know, what, yeah. what kind of VIG or what kind of implied VIG are usually on these futures bets? Um, 22% probably. Okay. Yeah, okay. but, uh, would would be the would, would the you know the the presumed hold there. I I, I you're right because that's a great. I'm I'm so glad you brought the Scotty Scheffler example and used ten to one, right? Because Rory McIlroy, who has been maybe like the second or third best golfer to ever play the game wins 10% of his tournaments. Right. And, and uh, Tiger Woods, when he was at peak powers was winning like 25% of them. these guys would be lucky now to win three to five. If you're winning three to 5% of your events, um, you're uh, just a shoe in for the hall of fame. This is the odds that we see, especially at the top are just, are just brutal. Uh, the middle and the longer guys, you can get some better ones, but it, it's unfortunate because 
the the the, the five favorites every week are almost almost unbettable. Well, it's interesting because then you you I overheard you saying in your um in your podcast this week about how we've had kind of almost an unprecedented run of chalk yeah. um, in the last couple of weeks. And that's, that's, I guess, incredibly rare. Um, and, and that's the, that's what I was going to, I wasn't going to ask that, but I was going to say is where do you think the lines that, like all fells being equal, which is obviously the great qualifier are worse. Like you, I would imagine that in golf, the worst odds were either at the very top because they're the people, the guys that people want to play. And I would like to think that some of a whole bunch of these hundred to ones, like, are really just basically five thousand to one shots. You know, right? That, yeah. that that like you said, like people. How often do people have a chance to bet a guy at hundred to one? Hey, look at this guy. I've never heard of him. I'll throw him in there. And listen, my son, he's 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 old enough to to, to bet now. He goes to UVA, and he I've seen him do it. He's like he's like looking even he's live betting. He's like, what about this guy? I'm going to start with the guys that are three hundred to one. You know, how about this guy? I'm like. He's just not winning. And he's like, but he's 300 to one. It like, doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Right. So I would imagine that the worst bets, I mean, again, all being equal, or maybe at the top. And then probably those, those guys, like when you play like DJ Singh, it's like 500 to one or something like that in the masters. Or that's like. that's probably fair. Uh, yes. I, I think the lines at the top, you know, because, and some we've seen some books, they just get spooked. Right. When, you know, when a, when a $500 ticket comes in on Scotty Scheffler, they want to move the line. Right. I mean, we've seen them get spooked so much by, by some of the guys at the top. And, and it's, you know, to kind of go back to what, what I was mentioning earlier, that, that 30 to 60 to one range for so long, was the money makers and it was oh. it was winning disproportionately compared to how much they should be winning and that's why this this run that we've been on where all you know all of this um you know all these guys that are 20 to 1 or shorter are winning at a clip like we haven't seen in five or six years and probably longer than that if you wanted to mine it back. But like th this is an unprecedented run for the guys at the top of the board. So yeah, for someone like me who kind of has always lived from 30 to 60, like it, it's been a tough go. <laughs> well, you know what's cool about the 30 to 61 range is that is that you could find a guy that you've heard of, you know what I mean? That you know is, is pretty decent and get, go, you know, get, you know, good odds. You know, like these like exactly. like playing like playing Grillo at fifty to one every week is always a fun sweat, you know. Like playing like X Y Z at fifty to one is always a fun sweat. Once you start getting into two hundred to ones, then you're then you're into the then you're into the into those guys, you know. Right. How how much do you you think of the of the wagering is 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 live betting on golf? Um, well, golf is golf is unique that, you know, the play stops every night. Right. So I think what the vast majority of live bets come, uh, before and after rounds, right. I don't think that there are a ton of people, uh, at least not yet who are sitting there saying, wow, Tony Finau just birdied the hardest hole on the golf course. And he's going to go to a par five and then he's going to play a short par four. I'm going to look up his live odds and, and see where he's at and, and fired that way. I don't think there's a lot of that yet. Obviously there are people doing it, but I think a lot of people look at it uh, at the end of every night while everything's set and, and they fire from there. Now, Golf is also um, similar to baseball in which it will, it will be run by like these micro bets mm -hmm. and these mm -hmm. like immediate, will he hit the fairway? What score is he oh, going to wow. Yeah. yeah. Will he make this putt or will he miss this putt? Like that's coming. We have a data latency. I mean, it's just not fast enough right now with the way the data comes in, but mm -hmm. um, live, I, I believe is mostly happening before and after that's that. interesting yeah because i i again i i i view my uh i look at my, my son and his his group of dj friends is like the good the good example of like where the industry is going and and, and they just like literally that it's like you talk about kids they're people in general they're unable to schedule they don't they don't even know when rounds are starting they wake up they're like who's playing you know what i mean like they don't even know what, what hole it's on you know they're like this guy's like whatever you know but that's the beauty of high betting there's no yeah. there's no start time you know you could you go whenever and some people like oh, four holes to go i'll do a, a sprint sprint to the finish yeah, you I, know, I i'll do whatever also, i do think there's also the people who oh it's you know it's three o'clock and yeah. there's the covers just came on right let me, let me see where everyone's at i'm gonna watch this for the next couple hours let, let me ask you this what what um in in the head-to-heads yeah what, what's usually the big there what's it like 120 120 at least or not really no, it's usually, no. It's, it's like, yeah, like 120. 
That's not well. That's not bad. One twenty, one twenty. I was expecting. I was expecting. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's 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 it could be a lot worse, but it's yeah. Could well, again, worse. I mean, those are those are now when you when you when you analyze those, do you and I I fiddled around with this like the, the way I would do like my outright bets. I would start. I would like go backwards. I would I would do my DFS projections, and then I would say like this guy's ranked ninth in DFS projections, but like thirty second in in outrights. I'll take a shot. Now again, it's totally different, right? DFS scoring is different than and outrights and stuff like that. But, um, but um, when, when, I don't know when, when it, when it comes to the outright betting, I, I just find it, I find it so interesting. Do, do a lot of people do top tens and top twenties? There's more outrights. I mean, there. the people who take it more seriously are, are, are filling out their cards with outrights and backing it up with top tens or top twenties, you know, understanding that, um, you know, someone like a Joel Damon who might be 80 to one to win the golf tournament, you're, you know, that's fairly unlikely, but if you're, uh, if you're bullish on him, those top 10 and those top 20 numbers are, uh, much more reasonable. I don't necessarily think that the, generic just very casual golf better is building out a card that you know accurately has uh, a small portion allocated to outrights a little bit more allocated to top 10s a little bit more allocated to top 20s and then 50 percent of it allocated to match up something like that like like that would be a well-designed card for a week i think there's few people who are doing that from from the dfs perspective like what what do you what do you say because i have my own thoughts i'll share with you after you finish what, what what are you seeing in the DFS community? Like like what do you see any trends? Do you see people playing a certain way? Do you see getting harder? Do you see edge dissipating? You see more inches? What what are you, what are your overall like fifty thousand foot views of DFS right? Yeah. So I think that um just like zooming out, like for, for the last five years, it used to be uh recency bias used to used to reign supreme and a guy who was coming off of a missed cut would have like sub eight percent ownership no matter who it was and you could just be like well that that doesn't really matter uh the other the other thing is um ownership projections have gotten much much better over the course of the last couple of years so i think those who are taking it seriously are just playing much more of a, a game theory aspect. And I think now we're almost moving to a point where um, the larger edges to be found are in showdown. Uh, you know, these single, these single round slates where most people, and, and it is not a knock against them. And sometimes the data doesn't even exist. Some people cannot um, accurately like assess what happened in round one versus what could happen in round two. You know, if you have a golfer who played great, but got unlucky because his ball crossed the hazard or he just hit everything to eight feet and didn't make a single putt. Like there's a lot of ways to shoot a 68 on the PGA tour. And I don't think most people are willing to dive deep enough into the rounds for 120 golfers to realize that. So I think that's kind of where the, the larger edge is coming right now. Um, there's still plenty, there's still plenty of um, opportunities to lean into the volatile nature of golf in, in, in classic mode, but showdown is, is I see the strangest things. And so people do not, do not get it. Hmm. Um, so I will, I will, I will share this with you. Um, I, as far as ownership goes, I, I've been track. I track ownership for, for quite a long time now. Yeah, and you I, you aggregate it all together, right? Yeah, and, and what I do is is I, I take a lot of different models and I I can and I test them for accuracy and I compare them. And I got to tell you, it is really tight. Um, they they're, they're overall they're really really good. I mean, you 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 get you get some some outliers, but but it's really not a lot like, like this, like this week, I, I was posted, I tweeted, I tweeted this, like Joel Damon was kind of like the one guy, I mean, he was, they projected like an aggregate about 13% or something like that. And he ended up 19. And then you get, you know, like Hovland was, we, you know, he came in like 4% more than expected, but it's usually real. First of all, the ownership projections across the industry are usually, I wouldn't say sort of, they're close enough. Um, but but overall, if you aggregate all this, which is always like the best way to do it, because a lot yeah. of large numbers kind of works that way. Like, like the when you compare like who does the best, the average of them all always does the best. Right. Always. Right. Um, and the ownership projections are really, really tight. And, and 
And this is this is what's happening in DFS is not only that, but the projections are just you just can't get a break. You know what I mean? Like when I say that, what I would do is I would I would do projections. I would I would aggregate. And then I, I adjust those for accuracy. I do whatever. And then what you try to do is you say, OK, so who's got a good projection based on whatever value metric you put on who might be low owned? OK, M- must be nice. Right. But but if a guy's going to project really, really well. He's going to project really well for everybody. So it's it's going to, it's very, it's very, very difficult. So then what happens is, and football started this and golf skins is doing this too, is what people, what, what sharp players do is then they say, okay, if we, this guy's going to project to be this high own, I want to play good GPB lineups. So I'll play less of him, you know? And then if this guy's going to be 1% owned, I'll play more of him. So kind of in a weird, like kind of GTO way, all this kind of converges a little bit, you know what I mean? And, and the ownership itself becomes a little more kind of regressing and stuff. So it's, um, it's really, I, I found it really, really difficult to find that kind of like, wow, this is like the highest rated guy and nobody's playing him. Like, like yeah, last week I, I saw, I, like my top rated value guy was, was, was Smotherman. Right. And he was, was like, I had a projected like 8% ownership. I'm like, it's just no way. It's just not going to happen that way. And then he was, he had the lead after day one, and it was thirteen percent on, and that's just the, that's just, that's just the way it's going to be. Because the fact is that I have access to the exact same databases and all the projection models that everybody else has access to, and, and it makes it, it makes it, it makes it tough. You know, it is interesting. You mentioned it because I think, I think um, databases is, it's, it's kind of part of the problem, right? So, so. The PGA Tour, uh, they control all the data, right? So there are only a handful of sites that get their data directly from the PGA Tour, which I think creates a situation where most people are using the okay. same databases, where as opposed to, you know, football or baseball, like there were the, – the way that stat data companies used to do this 20 years ago is they would sit an intern in front of a television who would chart every play wow. and – yeah. And every pitch and everything that happened, and that's the data feed. That's what goes into the data. Well, you can't do that with golf. So you have to get your data from the source. You have to get it from the PGA Tour. So I do think it's interesting because it does create a situation where everyone's using the same the same data. Everyone's using the same tools. Everyone's coming to the same conclusions. I mean, I'll tell you this. Let's check, check this out. Like, this is kind of one game sample, but it's not one game because I, I, I see it all the time. Um, th- th- this is this is my screen, okay? Which Hold on. Uh, I got gotcha. you. What what do you want? What are you what are you seeing actually? I'm seeing a spreadseet. Right. Of- so so this this aggregated everything with all my adjustments and it rated everybody by my value score. And at the very very top of the projection is Russell Henry. You know what yeah. I mean? Like and, and then he shows up. What is he minus 100 today? You know whatever it is. So and and this and this is what happens literally every week. And I have projected not at, you know 9.98 percent ownership, but that's just not going to be the case. He's not, he ended up being 17 percent. And and as much as you see like kind of a run of chalk at the top as far as winnings go, I see a similar, you know, run of chalk even in the mid range of you know even guys that get there, you know, and it's a uh, I guess a testament to the industry that they're and the databases and stuff like that. But it's I, um I, I don't have the I don't have it in front of me, but I, it's funny you so 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 yeah two things have happened um from the start of last season to now, not only are more. Short guys winning, right? 20 to one or shorter. Uh, but the the more popular plays, the guys that are 20% owned, 25% owned, etc., are doing better than they've ever done. Now that might be what your point. It's just like everyone's getting inherently sharper to find these to find these plays. And yeah, it's it's like so 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 what happens next? What do we like what like what do we do when it's this sharp? Yeah, it 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 is it, it is tough, and it is and it is difficult. Um, one of the thing, I mean, I'll I'll I will um, I will uh, I will throw this out there as kind of a plug for another company. Uh, I'm going to do that. Um, the, the 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 what I've used in, in situations like this, especially when I'm using GPPs, is you need you need a lineup builder that can kind of figure out you know, how to mix a good projection with, with, with low ownership, you know what I mean? And, and it's, and it's tough to do, you know, and, 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 and the, the company that I, I like is SaberSim. And I don't know if you ever talked to these guys, yeah. but, but, but SaberSim is like literally the only optimizer I use. Right. And because what they do, and they, I got the guy who started is CEO. His name is Andy Baldacci. I know him back from poker and they have a lot of guys working for them, whatever, really good data guys. 
And what they did is they created an optimizer that that didn't just produce optimals. They they ran sims that that create like these buckets of, of lineups that factor in both ownership and upside, right? And so what I and what I like to consider is not really an optimizer, but more of a, I guess a smart randomizer. I guess that's the best way I can describe it, you know? Because it's one thing to go into what you would call it, um, what's the big one? Fantasy cruncher and just set a uh, like a, a, a randomness slider. But what these guys do, it's a really cool algorithm where where it, it takes your your whatever medium projection that you put in but it knows the golfer's actual distributions, you know what I mean? And, and it factors in, you know, which, which golfer's median is like a, is like a median that's going to be more of a mode, right. And which, as opposed to which guy's median is going to be more of a, could have a, a good, good right tail. And when I, when I run my projections through Saberson, I get these lineups of stuff that I would never ever think of playing. <laughs> and yet these are the ones that win, you know what I mean? Or these are the ones that are, and that, that's the only thing I've tried to do is 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 use my median projections right. and throw them in a saber sim or and and any any i use saber sim but any kind of like smart randomizer and this for gpps look you want to play cash whatever yeah, just take just take the aggregate projection it ran optimize you know whatever and just do whatever but one thing again this is this is not not to just toot your horn or whatever but what i kind of like to do also and listen Anytime you can tweak a projection, you're automatically making yourself a little bit different. Yep. So sometimes I like listen. I always oh, not sometimes I always listen to your podcast. And when you like like a guy for whatever reason that you you have, it, it you, listen your result, your opinions are data driven as well. You know to some degree. So so what I'll do is if I'm not getting to say, you know Dean Burmester for example, right? I'll, I'll I'll bump him a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and and. That's okay. You know, like you, you don't have to be completely I'm at your numbers. You know, if yeah. someone's got a good real world opinion on it, I think you can, you can use that. And I, and I do think, yeah, that that's a skill, you know, knowing when to make a little tweaks or knowing that we might not know everything. Right. Mm -hmm. And embracing that, like that is, that's a skill and making those little adjustments to make yourself different across the board. Like, yes, for a hundred percent, couldn't agree more with that sentiment. And, and you know, one other thing I wanted to comment about golf, and this is again, this is from someone who absorbs content, Like you, you have, you have no time, right. To absorb others content. You, you have enough time to do deal with yeah. your own stuff. So I still have time to absorb like a lot of content. And I'll tell you this for, for a, for a sport, which for which projections are are completely data driven and, and and based on on numbers, the actual takes you hear out of a lot of content are so kind of hopelessly narrative based that it's like it's like kind of funny when you think about it. You're like, this guy won last year. There's no way I'm playing him this year. Yeah. I mean, I all of a sudden, just be even though his numbers pile up, you know what I mean? Or this guy's go coming back home well, to we, Arkansas. We, we, we joke about it sometimes too. It's like golf is the only sport in the world where you knock a guy who was the best last week, right? right. It's like, well, I can't right. do it again. Can't be right. the best again. And it's like, oh, well, how, how, however, they, 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 however, they did, they did manage to cram Victor Hovland in rather nicely. Into I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I go for the three P he's just, he's just too likable. And, 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 I, and I will give you one other, I don't want to say conspiracy theory, but this is one, not conspiracy. This is just, Again, I'm just reporting what I observe. So the other observation I will lend to you, which is really, I think it's really cool, is every once in a while, and again, this is based on what I aggregate, a guy will show up in like the top 10 values that I haven't seen in forever, like in like two years, okay? And I'm like, I literally don't believe it. You know, I'm like, I'm like there's just no way I'm playing X, Y, Z. I haven't seen this guy for whatever. Who is this guy? Whatever it is. I'll play him that week anyway, and he'll, you know, typically, you know, maybe he'll bust or whatever. But those guys always seem like very soon to get there. You know, I, I don't know whether that's just kind of like a but listen, the database, will, you know, obviously it shows something going on in a guy's game. Right. And, and and sometimes it's early, you know, and I'll give you a good example of it. One of them was was Keegan Bradley, actually, like Keegan Bradley showed up literally out of nowhere on my sheets one week. I'm like, who? I remember from St. John's, where, who, this guy? And then I'm like, really? And then within like two weeks, he's winning. You know what I mean? Or three weeks, he was winning. And that's, I, I don't know. I, I Listen, obviously, probably a lot of that is coincidence or whatever it is. But it's 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 kind of it's kind of amazing to me how sometimes these model darlings just kind of just show up 
And then, like, sometimes they, they stick around for a while and disappear. Like, there was a time, like, a year or two ago, where literally every week, Charlie Hoffman was just showing up yep. as, as, like, just, like, this incredible play. All of a sudden, at 48 years old, or however old he was, or whatever it is. And then he kind of just kind of disappeared. So it, it's kind of, I, I, again, because I'm always staring at this stuff, I find, I find those things interesting. Like, Justin Rose won one week within the last, like, eight months. Like, all of a sudden, just showed up. I'm like, huh? And then within like two weeks, he's like top three after the first couple of days or something like that. That was, I mean, my most re my most recent example, that was Ricky Fowler, right? Being a week early on Ricky Fowler. And it's yep. like, well, something's yep. something's yep. happening here. Yep. Must must happen at Shriners. No, it was the next week, uh, is is where it happens. I, I try to um uh, you know, I don't have like a great system for this, but I do try to keep almost like a running pool of golfers, right? Which is like, you know, if I liked you last week. There's not a whole lot of reason to not like you this week. If I'm still seeing kind of similar things and see if I can kind of take this pool of golfers with me, always kind of adding, always kind of subtracting uh, because you're, you're right. I mean, listen, if, if someone's modeling, well, they're probably going to model well for the next couple of weeks. It, it, it's, it's, it's not as easy as saying, Oh, well, he's modeling well and he's going to a place that should suit, suit him. I'm going to play him and then never play him again. It's it's not that easy. So I try to have this little traveling pool of golfers that it's always kind of um that's always kind of changing for me. You know, one one other thing I want to advise people that, you know, that you that you picked up on really nicely this week is is when you when you can go you know, put your biases aside and and just rely on the data. You were mentioning somebody this week that I think it was Jason Day, right? Like mm -hmm. listen, if you cross the name out, yeah. right? And just say this is the guy's profile. You're gonna want to play him. Yeah. But then, like, you you, you uncover the name, like Jason Day. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not doing that. You know. And and, and uh, it's uh. Listen. Uh, I I obviously have nothing. Nothing but nothing but but uh, but gold medals for, for for the Rick Rungood system. Whatever. Yeah. But, it uh, is it is, it is fascinating, right? What the, what the mind, what the mind wants to do, what the mind thinks, what the mind, I mean, even, even still, and I, I thought we'd be past this years ago. I get so many messages every week uh, that are like, Oh, you know, yeah. Jason day burned me. I'm never playing him again, which is like, I thought we were past this, you know, years ago. It's, it's just the, hu the human, the human brain uh, could do some funny things. Yep. All right. Well, listen, I'm, 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 I'm going to let you go, but, but um, every once in a while, I do want to catch up with you on, on, yeah, on, on state of affairs. And listen, every once in a while, if you want to do like a picks video or whatever, but that, that, that to me is much less interesting. You know what I, I mean? Like, listen, if you want to get, if you want to get Rick's picks, you can go to rickrungood.com. You get them for free every week on freaking YouTube, you know? And if, if you appreciate that, you'll subscribe to his, to his, to his, uh, to his site, which by the way, just full disclosure, I'm a full paid member of rickrungood.com forever. I'm getting, I get zero from him for any of this. Um, I only have him on my stuff because because people want to know who I respect and what I use. So that's that's why he's on. Well, here. well I, I appreciate you. And and, and yeah, the, these conversations that are yeah state of the union, state, whatever you want to call it, like these are it's always good to to, to jive with you. And uh, I learn something every time. And it's like it, it's nice to get out of just the weekly grind of who's yep. going to play well, who's not going to play well. And and we, we one, one of the one of these days we will we will we will play around somewhere. That is for sure. Absolutely. All right. See you later, Rick. Take care, right, buddy. Take care. Thank you. Right.